Greetings, I'm Matti Mali, aka Hidnostic Actor, and welcome to this series about random video games. So, Dragon Quest. It's the oldest role-playing game series people still talk about, and one that takes pride in being old-fashioned yet never feeling moldy. At least at the time of each game's release. Uh, in the mid to late 2000s, the series started to fully try to be popular somewhere else than just its native Japan, and I was caught to that wave as well. This is Dragon Quest IV, the Chapters of the Chosen. The first part of the loosely connected Zenith trilogy was released in 1990, and back in the day it was sold in USA under Dragon Warrior moniker, but Europe didn't get it until the 2007 Nintendo DS version. His creative team is the same as on the three previous titles, namely scenario writer Yuji Hori, the series creator who has worked on it since day one, and the director Koichi Nakamura, who would after this switch to producing with titles like Basta Move and Zero Escape series. Also, as a side note, I know the picture quality isn't that good, but I had to use an emulator for recording, so what can I do? Dragon Quest III Seeds of Salvation had two years prior managed to sell millions of copies and became the standard all of its successors would be converted to, so... What gimmick the fourth game would introduce to make it stand out? Come on guys, it's in the title. After naming and gendering the main character, we start with a prologue where our soon-to-be adult hero is spending blissful existence in a remote village and I'm sure nothing bad will happen to this village and its inhabitants. The real meat of the game starts with the first chapter where Ragnar MacRyan, a royal knight of the Kingdom of Burland, is tasked to search for children that have gone missing from the nearby village. He is... Um... He has pink armor, even though no one else has, and um, that's all there is to his personality. Yeah, don't expect deep character development out of any of the party members. Sure, this was first released at 8-bit Nintendo where there wasn't that much space for flashier storytelling, but there is a valid reason why this irks me. More about that soon. Gameplay-wise, Ragnar's chapter is the most simple of them all. You have only one melee guy who just hits monsters hoping that they expire before he does. Sure you get a friendly monster Healy as a party member later on, but he just makes the healing process automated. Not that getting killed is that big of a deal anyway, you just get teleported to the nearest church and lose half of your money. I recommend loading your previous save instead, it's much less of a headache. So eventually Ragnar finds the children and gets to know that the monsters are searching for the chosen one that is destined to stop the rise of their sleeping master, Lord of the Underworld. One boss battle later and... it's over. Missing children are saved and Ragnar ventures forward to find the chosen one. That took less than an hour. The majority of the five chapters doesn't take that long. The first four take about seven to eight hours from this 30 hour game and are essentially just an overstretched tutorial. Next we have Princess Alina of Zamovska, whose tomboyish and adventurous nature causes constant displeasure to her father, Char Stefan. She wants to prove to be the best fighter in the world and embarks on a journey to kick ass while accompanied by her mentor, Royal Wizard Borea, and a priest in training, Kirill, who is hopelessly in love with her. Alina sounds like a funny character and her interactions with her fellow teammates could bring some great comedy. That is, if she talked at all. That is partly explained by all the chapter main characters being silent protagonists, a trope that aggravates me but I'll save that talk to some other time, but there's not any kind of banter to flesh out these potentially interesting people. Hmm? You say that there is a party talk feature? Not in the European version there isn't. My weak theory is that they needed more courage space for all the language options, but thankfully this has been fixed in the 2014 mobile versions. Also thankfully a bigger party also showcases how well the combat is made. At the first glance it looks simple, but many of the fights feel to have a new strategic element in them due to each enemy having their unique patterns and quirks. Because of this, the relative frequency of random battles didn't annoy me as much as it usually would. 
Well, there are a couple of instances where you have to halt the story brokers and stop the grinding or to beat the next stuff boss, but luckily those instances are in two numbers. Back at the plot though, Alina and company have done various heroic deeds and have reached the city of Endor, where a fighting tournament is held. King Norman has promised his daughter Veronica to be wedded to the winner, but the current best fighter is a shady individual named Saro, the Manslayer. However, when the time of confrontation comes, Saro is nowhere to be seen, so Alina wins the tournament by default and the wedding prize is called off. Her satisfaction is short-lived though, as in her home castle, everyone has disappeared. Wow, the story really went into gear with this one. Too bad that same gear goes to a halt for the next chapter. Here our easily relatable person is Torniko Taloon, a middle-aged man living with his wife Tessie and son Tipper on a small town working as a weapon seller in someone else's shop. He however dreams big and decides to go traveling in order to become the best killing tool merchant in the world. The first problem with this chapter is that Torniko travels alone, which means the combat is once again simple. By the time you're able to hire a bodyguard, he's powerful enough that monsters don't cause him significant trouble anymore. It tries to hold off the monotony by making the dancers more puzzle oriented, but this doesn't help when there's no new one for the last third. At there, King Norman of Endor has made an order for six steel broadswords and six iron armors, which means that you have to wander back and forth the same places on this tiny map area, hoping that the monsters will drop this item soon. What even was the story barely moves forward? Torniko hears about Zenithian's sword that can supposedly defeat evil and that's it. The game apologizes for it though by making the fourth chapter about vengeance. In this surprise change to more melancholy twin sisters Maya, a carefree belly dancer, and Mina, a serious fortune teller, are trying to avenge the death of their father Mahabala, who was murdered by his former student, Balzac. They find Mahabala's another former student, Ujan, who thinks Balzac was after the secret of evolution, which their father was researching on. I've heard the function of this chapter is to teach how to arrange your party for battles, but for me it was never clear how their different positions affected their abilities. The group eventually reaches further north, where the new tyrannical regent is rumored to imprison people for their souls, and who makes everyone speak in French accent. Uh... What? Now it's a good time to talk about the English localization, which has caused mixed reactions. I'm not that big of a fan of the accents. I mean, it makes the game world livelier when uh, different people from different regions have their own uh, speech patterns. But sometimes the placement is confusing, like with this French one, and uh, sometimes understanding them, especially Scottish and Irish, can get difficult at times. And the other uh, criticized aspect is the pun-filled humor and the terminology. I don't uh, usually like puns, yet with Dragon Quest IV there's some kind of odd charm to it. It feels earnest. But let's end chapter 4 with one hell of a climax. The sisters break into the regent palace who turns out to be Walzak. And after an epic battle turns out he was just a second fiddle to Marguerite de Leon. The name Saro the Manslayer is once again thrown into her, and then Leon waxes the floor with them, most likely making this video game history's first hopeless boss battle. They manage to get out from the palace's prison, and with Ojam securing their escape, the twins have no other choice than to flee to Endor and search for the mysterious chosen one. It's time to start the last chapter and return to the main character's blissful existence in this idyllic village where I'm sure nothing bad will ever ha- Damn it. In quick succession our hero finds out their parents aren't really their parents, and then monsters attack and kill everyone they've ever loved. Curse you, Sarah the Manslayer! I like how they work with Sarah's character by giving a small pieces of information little by little, slowly building the mystery surrounding this elusive being. Dragon Quest franchise isn't known for its complex villains, but unlike many other run-of-the-mill sadistic demon lords, Sarah is a tragic figure who is stoic and has his softer side. It wasn't anything too fancy, but still more nuanced than what the series and its rival Final Fantasy had to offer at that time. Thus our chosen one must travel to the West World, where a neat saddening tool is playing. 
Generally the series composer Koitsuzubiyama has been in his A game with this one, as 4 features one of the best soundtracks this series has to offer. And that's how the rest of the game goes. The hero travels around the world meeting the player characters from the previous chapters, and after the whole gang is together it's time to find the pieces of Zenithian equipment to deal with Zaro's threat. There are other activities too, like playing at the casino or trying to find mini medals, which can also bring some entertainment. That's pretty much sums it up, so if you have any interest towards this franchise, Dragon Quest IV or Chapters of the Chosen is a good place to start. It showcases the basic elements of the series both in good and bad, but mostly good. Combat is surprisingly complex and art style by Akira Toriyama of Dragon Ball fame is charming which the music enhances. The writing style is love it or hate it kind of deal and the plot structure can be rather loose at times, not to mention the non-existent party member characterization. As I mentioned though, the latter problem is fixed in the mobile version, so if you want the definite Dragon Quest IV experience, those are probably the safest bet. In case you're wondering, I have played the previous titles on an emulator under the Dragon Warrior moniker. One or two are too archaic and simple for me to properly enjoy, but the third one was a fun little romp. I do have one other Dragon Quest game in my collection, but that is a subject of some other time. Which may be the next episode, who knows? Interesting. Until then, thanks for your time.